The WTA celebrated its 50th anniversary this season, and you'd expect their marquee event, the WTA Finals, to be one to remember considering such a big milestone. Well, the finals were indeed memorable, but not in a good way. The ATP Finals concluded last week, and we were treated to high-quality matchups, smooth scheduling, excellent crowd attendance, and overall pretty content players. The WTA Finals had none of this. Eight of the world's top women traveled to a beach resort in Cancun, Mexico to compete in the year-end championships held from October 29th to November 6th. Now, the tournament was supposed to end on the 5th, but the championship match was pushed back an extra day due to weather. More on that later. Tournament organizers built a temporary 4,000 seat stadium atop a golf course and players could not practice on the stadium court until a day or so before the first match. The $9 million tournament got off to a bumpy start, no pun intended. Arna Sabalenka blasted the tour after she scored a dominant 6-love, six 6-1 six win over Maria Sakri. Sabalenka made a statement to her social media saying she and the other woman felt disrespected by the WTA. The world number two also says she didn't feel safe moving on the court due to the uneven bounce, which she felt was unacceptable to her with so much at stake. Ego Sviantek made similar comments expressing her disappointment at not being able to practice much on the stadium court ahead of her first match. Marketa Vondrasova, who made her finals debut this season, was outspoken on social media and during her press conferences, saying she felt that the WTA doesn't listen to players' opinions. While the courts were a big problem, perhaps even bigger was the weather conditions in Cancun. It was hurricane season in the resort town, subjecting players to extreme winds, which made for brutal playing conditions. Even the tournament's $5 cheap umbrellas crumbled under the pressure. But in all seriousness, all the players struggled with the win at some point. But it was Igor Sviantek who adjusted the best. Speaking of the actual tennis, I was honestly very disengaged with the finals because the level of the tennis was so poor. A lot of the earlier round robin matches were one sided, with five of the first eight sets of the tournament being six love or six one sets. And then between the two semifinals and the final, the score lines read six two, six one. 6-3-6-2 and 6-1-6 love. Even the victors of these lopsided matches came up with more errors than winners and the three set matches we did witness were riddled with erratic tennis and rain delays. Some players like Coco Golf, for example struggled immensely with their serve. Golf hit a whopping 17 double faults in her round robin win over Vondrasova. The rain definitely put a damper on the action. Players and fans dealt with multiple weather delays which pushed three high stake matches back another day. Sabalenka and Rabakina's round robin playoff duel and then Sabalenka and Svantec semifinal which was halted after just three games. That semifinal pushback forced the tournament to showcase the final on Monday instead of Sunday. All things considered, the crowd attendance was decent in Cancun especially in the knockout stages. However, some doubles matches had little or no fanfare at all, which was a stark contrast from the ATB finals where the stands were mostly filled for the doubles matches. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, while the WTA even picked Cancun, knowing that they'd have to build a temporary stadium on top of a golf course and Cancun was in the midst of its hurricane season. The WTA initially defended the conditions in Cancun before acknowledging that the finals was not a perfect event in a letter to the players leaked to Sports Illustrated. The WTA infamously nailed down Cancun as the host site less than two months before the start date, perhaps foreshadowing the ish show to come. WTA CEO Steve Simon said this late selection was based on a number of complicated factors. This whole location snafu was actually never supposed to happen. The tour signed a 10-year deal to stage the finals in Shenzhen, China from 2019 to 2028. The 2019 finals in Shenzhen were moderately successful in terms of crowd support, but above all, everything ran smoothly. Plus, the lucrative deal brought a massive $14 million prize money pool. Champion Ash Barty earned a record $4.42 million in prize money, which I believe is the largest payout in prize money for a woman in a single tournament. COVID prevented the finals from being held in 2020, and in 2021, the virus was still not contained in China, which forced the tour to move the finals to Guadalajara, Mexico. A month after the 2021 finals, things got more complicated after the disappearance and silencing of Chinese player Peng Shui, who made allegations against former Chinese Vice President Zhang Gao 
Li. The WTA announced that it would not stage any tournaments in China until they could directly communicate with Pong and her claims were appropriately investigated. Many applauded Steve Simon for this move, although China's strict COVID protocols would have prevented any tournaments from being held in 2022 anyway. The 2022 WTA finals remained in North America, the eight women traveling to Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas to compete in the 14,000 seat Dickies Arena. Both the 2021 and 2022 finals had drastically lower prize money purses at $5 million compared to $14.75 million for the ATP finals. The 2021 finals in Guadalajara did well in terms of crowd support, although the higher elevation did bring challenges for some players. The finals in Texas were much cleaner due to it being an indoor tournament, but the crowd showing was subpar for such a high caliber event. Now, when searching for a host for the 2023 finals, the WTA considered the Czech city of Ostrava, who reportedly offered a four-year contract that would have offered players $15 million in prize money for these championships. However, there was a concern that Arna Sablanka and other Russian or Belarusian players would not be allowed into the country due to the Ukraine-Russia conflict. There were also consistent rumors about a lucrative bid from Saudi Arabia, although talks of that sparked criticism due to human rights concerns within the country. The Saudis have attempted to take over many sports, with tennis being the next target. The tour did only sign a one-year contract with Cancun, so I would not be surprised if we did see the finals in the Middle East in 2024. The WTA finals is undoubtedly the tour's biggest moneymaker, so it should come as no surprise that the tour has been struggling financially since that China deal fell through. In 2019, the WTA reported revenues of $109 million, with an operating loss of $1 million. In 2020, revenue was $37 million, with an operating loss of $16.5 million. This revenue loss gap isn't getting much better either, with talks about the tour potentially going bankrupt in 2026. Steve Simon has since come out and denied these claims. The WTA struggles are worsened by the tour's subpar marketing and promotion of its players and matches. The tour made a huge mistake, in my opinion, in severing its ties with Tennis TV, which handles a majority of the promotion for the ATP Tour, posting edgier highlight clips and funny and even controversial on-court moments. This type of content gets people engaged with the sport, but the WTA is lacking heavy in this department. TikTok is probably the most popular social media platform at the moment, especially among younger audiences. Tennis TV's TikTok account has amassed over 1.5 million followers, while the WTA is stuck at 14K, and they haven't even posted in over three years. Tennis TV is also the ATP's exclusive streaming service. The WTA has its own platform, WTA TV, but that doesn't even have its own mobile app to support it. If we're being honest, the tour needs to hire Sabine Lissicky fans and have them run a WTA affiliated account to boost more engagement because they often do a better job than the tour promoting these players. To get itself above water, the WTA inked a $150 million deal with private equity firm CVC Capital Partners. In return, CVC will receive a 20% stake in the company and will oversee key structural changes, which includes top players being largely prohibited from competing in 250 level events. That initiative is reportedly an effort to increase the value and attention to the bigger marquee tournaments. The WTA also said it will invest more in marketing and ensuring equal price money between the female and male tennis players. Aside from the four majors, the women are generally paid less than the men for combined tournaments like the Italian Open. This year, men's champion Daniil Medvedev took home roughly $1.2 million, while women's winner Elena Rabakina earned $570,000. This disparity is largely because the WTA contributes less financial support for these tournaments compared to the ATP. The women themselves are tired of being treated second fiddle to the men. After various player meetings and discussions at the China Open, 21 top players sent out a three-page letter to the WTA leaders requesting changes. Some of these requests include better match scheduling, fewer mandatory events, and larger hotel rooms for players traveling with children. They're also calling for guaranteed compensation for the top 250 players. For example, players in the top 100 should make a minimum of 500k a year. The first main focus for the WTA is to improve its relationship with its players because it is a bad look to have them consistently bashing the tour for being inadequate. And this didn't just start with the finals. It was an issue
issue in Montreal when Elena Rabakina said leadership was weak. In addition to dealing with scheduling issues, price money disparity, and subpar playing conditions, these athletes often complain of being left in the dark on important decisions. There's allegedly a large lack of communication between WTA leadership and the players themselves, and the tour must strive to fix this. There have been talks with the potential merger with the ATP, but as I said before, partnering with Tennis TV could solve a lot of the tour's marketing and promotional issues. They did say they were working on initiatives that would better serve the players in the long run, but actions speak louder than words. I truly believe 2024 is a pivotal make or break season for the tour. I hope they make it because these women deserve better. That's all I have on this for now, and let me know in the comments if you think the WTA can dig itself out of this hole next season, or will things only go from worse to worser? Also, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post new content. And before I go, I quickly want to shout out to Manny Carroll of The Guardian and Matthew Fetterman of The Athletic for their excellent reporting on this situation. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Christian Bastin, and I'll see y'all next time here on Grand Slam Tennis News Today.